Hey everybody, my name is Scott Crane. I'm a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Sustainability at the University of Oklahoma, and I also serve as the coordinator for the Oklahoma Alliance for Geographic Education. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about the science of climate change for a little bit, and then we're gonna look at how we can use that science and use that information to apply it to the classroom. That's the main focus of these professional development activities where we have some content uh, expert, that's me, I'm a climatologist, uh, talk about the science and then we'll transition to how we can in incorporate and use that information in the classroom. So I'll give you a bunch of my slides uh, first and we'll talk about the science and evidence of the climate change. And then I will show you some of the slides and the examples and the lesson plans from one of our uh, OKH teacher consultants, Angela Trent, who teaches sixth and seventh grade geography and social studies. Angela couldn't be here today, unfortunately, but we've worked together and she put together uh, a series of slides and a lesson that she uses in her classroom. And I will talk about that as well. All of this material, all the slides that you're gonna see over the next 45 minutes or so are on the OKH website. So you can look at that uh, if you want uh, the slides, if you want the information. And you can also uh, talk to Becca Castleberry, who's the OKH uh, program director, or talk to myself and I'll give, us more, I'll give you more information toward the end of the lecture. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is I just wanna share my screen. And so we'll go on to climate change. So here we are, uh, for those of you of a certain age, you'll recognize this picture, this is your planet on drugs. You can see the earth there heating up as the egg yolk. And so this is what I wanna talk about. Climbing temperatures, melting glaciers, rising seas, all over the earth, according to Time Magazine, we're feeling the heat. Why are we not doing anything about it? And so climate change is a very relevant current topic. You can see from this picture, of course, this picture is actually 20 years old. Uh, so it's been going on for a, a long time. You don't have to go back 20 years. You can go forward and you can look at more current events. This is a, a picture from the Wall Street Journal today, uh, actually in talking about the uh, increasing ice melt off of Antarctica everything over here in this diagram, all these oranges and, and, and reds are more warming, uh, more melting connected to, war to the warm ocean. And again, if you melt this, if you melt land ice, you're gonna have sea level rise. So that's a current example. This is another current example over here to the right. This is a picture of the forest fires in Siberia. You may have been reading about that over the last couple of months. Siberia and the Arctic is warming up at a rate of two to three times the globe as a whole. And we will look at some of the impacts of Arctic warming. This is just one example, the melting permafrost, uh, drier conditions, increased fires is one. So here's some other examples. If you can't read this picture, it says no boats. So if you didn't look at the landscape and, and figure out that you can't put your boat there, the sign might give it away. And so then the question becomes, why is it that we have a no boating sign in the middle of a dry uh, sandy area? Well, the reason you might have guessed is that normally this is full of water. So you think about, well, what's the impact of increased warming? Uh, in this case, decreased precipitation. There's no boating. I'll give you another example of this place. You can maybe guess where this is. So here's the lake and you can see the ring here where the water typically is and you can see the drop in the water and you can see the dam over here. I'll give you another hint as to where this is. This is one state. This is a, another state. So this is uh, Arizona and Florida and this is Hoover Dam. So what's the impact of Lake Mead? That's the lake behind Hoover Dam. Dropping like that? Well, uh, potentially less electricity. You can think of what Las Vegas would look like if there was less uh, neon signs out there. Uh, less water availability. A lot of the area in Southern Nevada gets water from Lake Mead. And so if you drop the water level when it has been dropping, you run the risk of water shortages. It's not so much that they're gonna run out of water, but the cost connected to accessing that water is gonna go up. So the city, uh, of Las Vegas and the surrounding areas have spent a couple of hundred million dollars putting in new straws, deeper wells to access this water because the water's dropping. So there's an example of climate change. They spent a couple hundred dollars, a couple hundred million dollars to access the water from Lake Mead lower down in the 
lake because there's concern about the lake dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And so these are some examples of climate change. You've probably seen a picture like this. This is a temperature diagram over the last almost 150 years, 140 years. And you can see about a, a degree Celsius, two degrees almost Fahrenheit increase in temperature over the last 150 years. And you really notice it uh, over the last 60 years, say since the 50s, maybe where we've seen a, a really dramatic increase in temperature. And if you look at it closely, particularly over the last oh, 40 years, 50 years, you see that the rate at which the temperature is increasing is increasing. And so it's really an exponential increase more than a linear increase. So that the, the, the 20 teens, the 2010s were the hottest decade on record, the, the, the noughts, the noughties, the zeros uh, were the second hottest decade on record, the 90s were the third hottest decade on record, the 80s were the fourth hottest decade on record. You get the idea. So global warming, when we think about climate change, most people think about uh, temperature increase, although it's not just temperature. And I'll talk more about that as we go through. And so we talk about climate change I think one of the questions that comes up is change from what? What's the temperature of the earth? What's the structure of the earth? What are we changing from to get to that last picture? And so I want to do a little thought exercise where we can think about what the temperature of the earth is and then we can think about ways that it might have, might have caused that warming. So think of the ball. You got the earth, this big ball in the middle of the uh, solar system in the middle of space. We get the energy coming in from the sun. So what's the temperature of the earth? We got the energy coming in from the sun. It obviously heats up the earth above absolute zero, above negative 273 degrees. And so it's the temperature of the earth. So think about that for a minute. Uh, I'll pause for just a second for you to write down a number. What's the overall average temperature of the earth? Okay, well, if you've got an estimate, let's look at what the answer is. If we have just energy coming in from the sun, so you can see the squiggle line there, radiation um, coming in from the sun, insulation, what we call incoming solar radiation, we would get that the temperature of the earth is about zero degrees Fahrenheit. So what the sun does is the sun heats up the earth atmosphere system from absolute zero, meaning zero degrees Kelvin, negative 273 degrees Fahrenheit, to zero Fahrenheit. So that's a zero to zero increase in temperature that's a dramatic increase in temperature and, and the energy from the sun is what gets us to zero degrees now think about zero degrees fahrenheit for a minute that's 32 degrees below zero that's significantly they're 32 degrees below freezing that's significantly colder probably than most people are guessing and if we were at that temperature zero degrees fahrenheit 32 degrees below freezing the earth would be a ball of ice. The earth isn't a ball of ice. I'm talking to you. We're all here on, on earth. And so there's got to be something else other than energy coming in from the sun that heats up the earth to where we actually have it now. And that's actually the greenhouse effect. So the earth isn't zero degrees. Uh, it's about 60 degrees. And so what gets us from zero to zero is the sun, negative 273 Fahrenheit to zero Fahrenheit or zero Kelvin to zero Fahrenheit. But what gets us from zero to 60 is the, is the atmosphere itself. And the atmosphere, and particularly what we call radiatively active trace gases, particular, ga particular gases within the atmosphere are ones that can absorb and re-radiate, not, not energy coming in from the sun, but rather energy coming up from the Earth's surface, longer wave energy coming up from the Earth's surface. And so it's that absorption and re-radiation of long wave energy by particular gases in the atmosphere that gets us from zero to 60, that actually gets us to a place where the Earth is a comfy, habitable planet. And so that's the greenhouse effect. It's a real thing, the science is there. It's a good thing. We want, we want to live in a, a nice, comfy, happy, uh, warm place. And so that's the first point, to think about the greenhouse effect. Here's a, here's a more complicated diagram. You've got the little squiggle of yellow lines there coming in from the sun. Those are the short wave energy. You can see the, the, the short wave length there. Heats up the, the sun, heats up the earth, goes from again, zero to zero, zero 
uh, Kelvin zero Fahrenheit. And because the Earth is now above absolute zero, it emits energy. It emits energy at a longer wavelength. You can see the red uh, energy coming up from the sun there. And then all the dots representing the atmosphere absorb and re-radiate, absorb, re-radiate, absorb, re-radiate, absorb, re-radiate, absorb, re-emit energy. And then that heats up the atmosphere. Again, that's the greenhouse effect. It's a good thing. The phrase greenhouse effect isn't really the best. <laughs> the atmosphere doesn't actually act like a greenhouse. The, a greenhouse acts because it blocks air motion. So the air inside the greenhouse is warmer and there's no mixing of air within and without uh, of the greenhouse. And of course we have lots of air, mixing of air in the atmosphere and lots of motion in the atmosphere. Uh, but I guess we're stuck with that term. The atmosphere doesn't trap energy. Uh, what comes in equals what goes out. There's a net conservation of energy. We're going to just warm up forever. Uh, so the atmosphere doesn't trap energy. The atmosphere doesn't act as a blanket uh, either, if you've heard that expression. A blanket works very similar to a greenhouse. A blanket works because the air near your body is hotter because your body is, is hotter typically than the surrounding air at night. And so the, the, the blankets block any interaction between the relatively warm air around your body and the cold air outside. So the atmosphere isn't really a greenhouse. It doesn't trap energy. It's not a blanket. But what it does is it gets us from zero to 60. It gets us to a nice, comfortable, habitable place. Okay. So what happens if we increase certain gases in the atmosphere that are radiatively active? And here's an example of the most famous uh, one of those gases, CO2 carbon dioxide. And what's been happening with carbon dioxide? If you go back 60 years, which is how long we've been measuring carbon dioxide globally, this is a Moana Observatory on the Big Island of Hawaii, you'll see that carbon dioxide is going up. We've increased carbon dioxide uh, about a third uh, over the last 60 years, from about 310 to 410, 415 parts per million. And if you look at this curve, you'll notice that it, the, the temperature, the carbon dioxide not only increases, but the rate at which it increases is increasing. So for example, if you start from the 60s and just draw a straight line, you, know, you end up at 360. If you start in the 70s and you draw a straight line, so to end up at 380, if you start, let's say, in the 90s and draw a straight line, you end up at 400. And so the rate at which it is increasing is increasing. This is an exponential curve here. Um, which say we're just putting more and more and more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And think how the greenhouse effect works. Again, if you increase gases in the atmosphere that are better at absorbing and re-radiating long wave energy, you're going to have more energy and connected to that, you're going to have more temperature. And essentially that's what's been going on. The other interesting thing to note, actually, if you look at this diagram, is the red and the red are the monthly values. And you can see them go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down, all the monthly values. And the cause for that, I think, is really interesting. The cause for that is essentially the season. So in the northern hemisphere spring, as the trees begin to leaf out, as our grass begins to grow green, as, as the crops begin to pop out and winter wheat pops out, let's say, in western Oklahoma, the plants absorb all that carbon dioxide. And as they absorb all that carbon dioxide, you can actually see the carbon dioxide globally shrink, reduce, and that's the drop there that you see in the red every year. And then in the Northern Hemisphere fall, the, the, the grass goes brown, the, the wheat or corn dies or gets harvested, uh, the, the leaves fall off the trees, releasing carbon dioxide, and you can see the, the red curve there, the monthly values go back up. What that means is you can actually see the respiration of the planet. You can see the planet inhaling and exhaling and inhaling and exhaling carbon dioxide. That's a natural phenomenon. It'll go up and down and up and down and up and down forever, except it's not just flat going up and down and up and down and up and down. It's going up that exponential increase. And that's because there's been more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so as you increase carbon dioxide, particularly over the last 60 years, I said we see that exponential increase in carbon dioxide. You can see that increase and, and really almost an exponential increase in temperature uh, over the same amount of time. When we talk about climate change, I think most people look at that diet last diagram, most people think about temperature. But when we talk about climate change, it's really much more than temperature. Here's an example of sea level 
rise over the last 140 years or so. And it's gone up about eight to 10 inches. You know, eight to 10 inches doesn't seem like a whole lot, uh, unless you're on Kiribati. I'll talk about Kiribati uh, Island in the middle of the Pacific in a minute, and you're at one meter, uh, two meters above sea level to lose a foot or almost a foot is a dramatic loss. Uh, if you're in Miami and there's a storm surge connected, even a rain event, uh, that extra, you know, six, eight, 10 inches of rain, uh, of sea level rise, it's just enough to have salt water back up into your sewers. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna have sewer backup problems. You're gonna have uh, erosion of your sewer lines because of all the salt water. And so places like Miami, Tampa, uh, New Orleans, uh, Venice, are really struggling with the sea level rise. Not so much that the city's gonna be underwater, but the cost to keep the ocean at bay is going up and up and up and up. And so when we talk about climate change, it's not just temperature, there's a lot of other things. Uh, there's a lot of other natural phenomena as well. I love this diagram. This is the diagram of the cherry trees in Japan, Kyoto, Japan, and this is the peak blossom of the cherry flowers. And so there's been some debate. You may have heard, well, the instrumentation is bad. How can we measure the whole globe? I don't trust the science. You know, maybe it's made up. It's satellites, uh, th thermometers, thermometers change. And you can say, okay, I, let's ignore the science. Let's forget the instruments. Let's look at what's happening to the planet itself, separate from humans. And so what this diagram shows is about at the same time, 140 years ago, you see a drop in almost two weeks. That's two weeks earlier than it used to be. So you can see the value up here about uh, April 15th, and now we're down to you know, almost April 1st, so 10 days, two weeks. The cherry blossoms are blooming 10 days earlier, two weeks earlier than they used to. Why? Because it's warmer, because spring is going on sooner. And so you may not believe the scientists, believe the cherry trees, right? So you can look at all this evidence to say, here's another example uh, of what's happening with climate change. If you were to draw up a model of what you would expect to happen if there was global warming, if we would see climate change, again, connected to that increase in these radiatively active trace gases, connected to the increase uh, in the gases that enhance the greenhouse effect, here's what you would find. So I recognize this is a bit, bit busy, but here's all these variables, and you would expect all of these variables work together, and not just global warming, but reduced glacier volume, reduced snow cover, um, Reduction in sea ice, increase in sea level, increase in ocean heat content, temperature, ocean heat content, temperature would increase, sea surface temperature would increase, water vapor would increase. Like this is this is what would happen. Okay, so let's actually look at what's been happening. And no matter which variable you pick, land surface temperature going up, sea surface temperature going up, uh, ocean temperature going up, sea level going up, ice going down glaciers going down, snow cover going down, moisture, specific humidity going up, heat content in the ocean going up. No matter how you measure what's going on within the ocean earth atmosphere system, all of the variables that we see, not just temperature, are matching and following a pattern connected to global warming, connected to climate change. And so you can see this however you wanna look at it. What's the cause of this? And so I wanna talk a little bit about the cause. Let's look at the bottom diagram here, the one that says solar and volcanic. And you can look at the blue line of the model. Now these are computer models. You can look at the blue line. And here's what the computer models say will happen if you have natural solar variability, and you can have natural uh, volcanic variability. And you can see the marks of big volcanic eruptions, uh, Mount Pinatubo, uh, El Shishon, the big volcanic eruptions over the last 30, 40 years. And when there is a big volcanic eruption, you can see a drop in temperature. But otherwise, we have natural climate variability. Climate goes up and down. You know, some days, some years are hot, some years are cold, some days are wet, some days aren't. But overall, you see the steady increase, the steady, this flat curve there in the blue. Temperature, uh, climate goes up and down. But generally speaking, it's a steady state. We call it stationary field, no trend, no change. The black is the diagram that I've showed before. That black is that increase uh, in overall temperature that we've seen. So if you just have natural variability, 
you can see what's happening is you cannot reproduce the change in climate, particularly over the last 60 years, uh, but really over the last 140 years, without changing the atmosphere itself. Now let's look at the top diagram there. You can look at the red and the black. And if you put the greenhouse effect into the model, if you allow for these radiatively active trace gases to increase uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, some other ones, you now can reproduce the climate change. So the only way that we can physically reproduce and explain what's happening in the atmosphere is if we add increased amounts of carbon dioxide and, and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. You can see the notes there on the slide. The explanations are inconsistent unless we increase carbon in the atmosphere. And so the cause of the increased temperature, at least part of the temperature, not all of it, because there's other variability, natural variability, but a cause of at least some, really most of the temperature change is because of changing constituents of these radiatively active trace gases in the atmosphere. Those are not occurring regularly. Those are not occurring naturally. They're occurring because we're putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so here's another diagram showing the same thing. This is a bit newer, but it merges them both. The green is natural variability. The, the, the black is, the, the green is natural variability in a computer model. The black is what's actually happening. The red is if you only put people in there and if you merge them, then you get the diagram that I showed on the last slide, which is a, you know, a spot on match. Natural variability and human uh, factors get you that increase in temperature. It doesn't matter what variable you look at. Yeah, I showed temperature, but you can look at land temperature, ocean, ocean heat content. The purple there are models that just have regular forcing, no humans. And then the pink are model that have natural and anthropogenic or human forcing and again, you see the increase if we put people into the mix. You don't see it if you have natural variability. And so the scientific body that's been studying this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has said that it's, it's quote, extremely likely, and that has a, a statistically meaningful significance, that humans have caused more than half of the observed increase in global temperature over the last 60 years. And it's not all of it. Uh, the sun's been warming up a little bit. There are some other feedbacks. There are some natural, there is some natural kind of variability, but the only way we see that increase is with humans uh, burning, uh, getting, uh, burning fossil fuels, getting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so when we talk about the enhanced or anthropogenic greenhouse effect, what we're talking about is adding more and more of these radiatively active trace gases, again, you think carbon dioxide mostly, methane, and more increasingly methane nitrous oxide, others. And the projection is that that will continue. As you saw previously, it's really an exponential curve. So the rate at which it will continue, will continue to go up and up and up. Uh, and we're not looking at two degrees warming over the next 140 years, which is what we've seen over the last 140 years, particularly the last 67 years. But double, triple, quadruple that uh, over the next, 30, 40, 50 years. And so let's put this into some kind of context. This is the diagram almost of the last million years of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. And carbon dioxide has fluctuated uh, somewhere around 200 and 300 parts per million. We've gone from 300 to about 415. Now, if you look at projections for the future, because of that exponential increase, we're not going to be at 415. We're going to be six, seven, eight, nine hundred. We're going to be double what we are now. So you can think what a 30% increase over the last 60 years has done. What's going to be an increase that's 10 times that? And so there are different ways to look at the projections of climate change. I don't want to talk about a ton of them. I'll just talk about a couple of them. So it's starting to run out of time a little bit here. Uh, this is the next 30, 40 years in temperature. Let's look at Oklahoma. This is in Celsius, so degrees Celsius, so two and a half, three degrees Celsius. That's five, six degrees Fahrenheit in Oklahoma. What does it mean to have Oklahoma be five or six degrees hotter? Well, in August, <laughs> it just means that it's good. August is going to be even more brutal. 
than it normally is, but you can think about other impacts of what that's going to mean. Here's temperature and anything in yellow or, or uh, orange or red is less, uh, sorry, precipitation, anything yellow, orange or red is, is a decreased potential uh, available precipitation over the next uh, 30, 40 years. And what you can see is a drop in several inches a year of precipitation. And so you can think about what does it mean to have warmer temperatures and a lot less precipitation. Well, if you get that, if you take that to the extreme, we're gonna look at the Dust Bowl. And I'm not saying that the Dust Bowl will happen every year. I'm not gonna say it's gonna happen every 10 years. But what this means is that in the future, because of us, because there's more carbon dioxide, because this change in the climate system, we're more likely to see conditions that are going to be drier and hotter in Oklahoma. Does that mean any storm, any tropical cyclone, any one year is directly contributable to climate change? Not necessarily. It means that we've shifted the probability. So let's give an example uh, to illustrate that. Think of a coin. If you flip a coin, what's it gonna be when you flip it? Is it gonna be heads or tails? You have no idea of knowing, right? It's a random event. It's an independent occurrence. You don't know if it's gonna come up heads or if it's gonna come up tails. What you do know, however, is that in the long run, if you flip it 100 times, or if you flip it 1,000 times, or if you flip it a million times, it'll come up about 50% heads and 50% tails. Now, what climate change does is it changes the probability. So think of a coin, instead of it being 50-50, think of it being 70-30, 70% heads, 30% tails. Now, if you flip it once, which would be the equivalent of saying, you know, what's tomorrow's weather like? You don't know what the outcome's gonna be, right? Could be heads, could be tails. If you flip it once, it's a random, still a random event, still independent. But over the long run, if you flip it a hundred times, if you flip it a thousand times, if you flip it a million times, what's going to happen? You're going to get 70% heads. And so that's what climate change does. You can think about the heads and tails as, let's say, being more droughts. Right? And a year could be either heads or tails. But in the long run, 70% of them are going to be droughts and 30% aren't, aren't, aren't. And so that's what climate change does in the future. What are the impacts? I'll come back to this slide when we look at uh, Angela's lesson. Uh, increase in infectious diseases uh, is gonna be the projection. Uh, not to say that this pandemic uh, is caused by climate change, but the conditions that facilitate increased pandemic-like events are going to increase in the future. Crop yields, water supply, beaches, and so forth. You can think about what the impacts are. And well, again, I'll talk more about the lessons uh, when we look at, uh, talk about more of the impacts when we look at the lessons in a minute. Okay, so what I wanna do in the time that I've got left is to talk about who is responsible. Specifically, we know it's mostly humans, but which humans, and then what can be done to address uh, climate change. So I will talk a little bit about uh, what's been happening and then what we project to happen and the, what we can do about it. And so if you look at what, who is responsible, well, if you go to the most recent uh, backup, you go to the most recent numbers, 2018, you can see that the biggest area here is China. Asia collectively is, much, is a lot bigger there as well. And the United States. So China is the biggest uh, carbon emitter. Carbon emitter. Uh, now, second is uh, the United States currently. However, if you integrate this or you count up the whole area of all the blue, let's say for the United States versus all of the red there for China, you see the United States collectively uh, is the number one emitter. The other thing you can pick up from this grass, uh, graph is that this, see this exponential, it's just this huge spike. It goes from, particularly right after World War II, goes from what, totally five billion tons to 35 billion tons. So a 700% increase, a sevenfold increase in the last 70 years. And again, the, the rate at which it is increasing is increasing, you have that exponential increase. Now, where does that energy come from? Where does that carbon come from? Uh, mostly fossil carbon, I'll show it on the next slide. So it's coal, natural gas, uh, oil. Some of it is land use change. It, essentially that's deforestation. And the deforestation used to be most of it, sort of before the explosion of the use of oil, uh, particularly after World War II. I mean, you see most of the carbon was land use, uh, but now it's, it's essentially a fossil fuel burning. And so where is that going? Well, some of it is going into the oceans, and you can think about what happens if you have carbon dioxide into the oceans. 
Well, go back to basic chemistry. What happens if you put carbon into H2O, uh, into water, you actually get carbonic acid. And so putting all this carbon dioxide into the ocean has actually made the oceans a little bit more acidic. I'll talk about that example. We'll look over the lesson plan in a minute. Some of it's going into the ocean, some of it's going onto the land, but increasingly more and more and more of it is going into the atmosphere. And that increase in the atmosphere is what we saw with the Moana oil graph. And we talked about the impacts of that earlier. So where are that, where is that coming from in terms of fossil fuel type? Coal, oil, natural gas, mostly a little bit of cement production. Uh, you'll notice that the coal has kind of flattened out interestingly. But again, you see that explosion there, coal, oil mostly uh, over time. So that's where it's coming from. Now what, we can, what, what can we do about this in the future? This is a little bit of a complicated diagram, but let me walk you through this. And this begins to think about mitigation or about how we can reduce climate change in the future. And so this is a, a probability density. So this is all the possible outcomes. The dotted line is if we do nothing. Sorry, the, 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 the red line there is if we do nothing. Uh, most likely outcome here is about a little over two degree increase Celsius. Um, if we do something, it's not two, it's one and a half degrees. And, and you can say, well, if we do something, it's, it's if we do nothing, if we do something, it's one and a half degree increase. If we do nothing, it's two degrees increase. That doesn't seem like a whole lot. But again, I don't like to think about climate change in terms of the averages. Think about it in terms of the day-to-day -day impacts or the extreme events. And if you look at this graph, you can see the impact on the extreme events. So what the policy, no policy does is it really reduces or minimizes the probability of the extreme events, five, six, seven degrees, again, Celsius warming. So that's 10, 12, 14 degrees more uh, increased temperature uh, Fahrenheit. And we're basically eliminating those extreme events. So we have a 5% chance of being at five degrees. Uh, if we do nothing, we have a 5% chance of being at three degrees. Two, three degrees is probably more manageable. Five Celsius, six degrees Celsius is just that sort of doomsday uh, scenario. And so that's when we think about uh, mitigation, reducing carbon emission. That's what we're thinking about, thinking about shifting the probabilities. And so how do we actually mitigate? Uh, let's look at the blue oval there on the right. Mitigate meaning reduce the amount of carbon, um, have a policy there to reduce carbon energy efficiency, renewable energy. Renewable energy in Oklahoma is a great example. We have gone from 0% of our electricity from wind uh, 20 years ago to over a third of our electricity from wind uh, now in the state with no negative impacts uh, other than the positive impacts of the jobs and money connected to those wind turbines. Uh, carbon sequestration, uh, capture of, of uh, energy, increased carbon sinks. We can, you can actually process some carbon energy uh, and just process it, it uh, drill it, process it, collect it, refine it in the same spot. You can actually take that carbon and pump it back underground. So you can use it, look at carbon sequestration, carbon capture and sequestration, for example. So that's mitigation, reducing the severity of the increase in the temperature over the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years. The oval on the left is adaptation. So you saw with that policy, no policy, that no matter what we're gonna do, we're gonna, in, the temperature is gonna go up. Climate's gonna change, sea level rise is gonna go up. And so in addition to thinking about mitigation as the way to get rid of the doomsday scenarios, the worst, it's gonna go up anyway, unless we all get rid of all electricity, all cars immediately, which of course is not gonna happen. So we need to think about adaptation. Adaptation could be health programs, letting people know about how to respond to heat waves. Uh, for example, uh, it can be contingency planning. We can have better infrastructure, higher seawalls. Um, we can re-express where uh, we build relative to floodplains. And all of that is combined. And we look at thinking about climate change as adaptation, responding to the climate. Uh, change and mitigate, which means reducing the climate change is something that we'll come back to in just a minute when we look at the lesson plan. And so how do we actually get there? I'll end with this slide and then I'll go over to the lesson plan. So the two degree trajectory there is, is the model that most scientists say, well, if we can keep warming to two degrees more than we are now, two degrees Celsius, so it's three to four degrees Fahrenheit. It's gonna be bad. We're gonna see impacts. Uh, we're gonna see severe impacts, but it's, it's a manageable and we can get there. We can get there through energy conservation, renewable energy, nuclear energy, 
CCS again is carbon sequestration, carbon capture and sequestration, forests uh, switching to natural gas and so forth. And so we can get to mitigation there by reducing our carbon emissions. And then we can think about adaptation as well. All right, so that's it for the science. Uh, what I want to do now is to look at the um, lesson plan that Angela Trent, our OKHTC, put together. So let me just um, share the screen again, and we'll look at the lesson plan that she developed. And so here is her lesson plan. And so these slides you can see, there it is, Angela Trent. Uh, these are her slides. She's done a fabulous job of taking the science of climate change and working it into the classroom. Now, again, all these slides are on the OKH uh, website. And so I encourage you to, to download this material and, and, and to use it in the classroom. Uh, again, sixth and seventh grade uh, geography, and she's a gun pull. So I'm going to go through some of this quickly since we've talked about the science of so the focus here is to talk about climate change, to look at adaptation and mitigation, and then we'll do some real world scenarios at the end. And this is what Angela uses in the classroom. And so what are the impacts? How do we respond to the objective is to get the students to understand the real world effects of climate change and to think about this adaptation um, and mitigation. And then the the, the take home activities gets them to think about, understand and, and, and view climate change in the future. Now this can be used at sixth and seventh grade lessons. You can see the Oklahoma um, academic standards there. These are the new standards that this is addresses. So human modification of the environment, impact of climate change. It also links to fourth grade. You can do this at the fourth grade uh, level. And, and, and of course, if you're teaching a high school class, you can use this as well it also addresses the national geographic standards and 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 so working through these lessons specifically and and exactly highlight and address some of the local and the state standards so here's the ease of five ease approach to looking at how to do this we'll talk about the tqd in a minute so we engage the students we're going to explore the lesson uh, through the evidence cards and i'll walk through those uh, in a minute there's a nice um, PBS video that Angela shows the student. I'm not going to show it now, but you can see what the link is. You'll have access to that talking about adaptation and mitigation. And then there's a breakout, elaborate and evaluate activity uh, connected to adaptation and mitigation and then an exit ticket and then a potential uh, follow up. And then of course you can come back and look at the discovery component uh, on that TQD approach. And so here you go. You start off with this, you get the students to think things they think they know, questions they want to investigate. We'll go through the evidence cards, we'll look at the case studies, and then we'll come back and look at the discoveries uh, made after, after we've, we've addressed this. So here are the evidence cards, and I've talked about uh, some of this going through. So temperature has been increasing. The rate at which it's been increasing is increasing. So that's the first piece of evidence. The second piece of evidence is a drop in ice. Uh, polar ice, glaciers, land, sea ice are all dropping. You can just, I didn't show this in my lecture, but here's the last 70 years or so, and particularly in the last 60, you can really see the drop off, in this case, in Arctic sea ice. Uh, sea level is going up. This is a diagram that I showed in my lecture. Uh, ice caps are melting, permafrost is melting. The ocean is warming up, and as the ocean warms up, it expands as well. You can see evidence of that, and then the final, evidence card is that ocean temperatures are rising. This is a nice 3D cross section of the Indian Atlantic Pacific Ocean. And anything in red here is going to be warmer ocean temperatures over the last 60 years. Anything in blue is cooler temperatures. And what shows up across the board is an overwhelming amount of orange and red, meaning an overwhelming, uh, overwhelming amount of increasing temperatures. So not always, not 100% uniform but really dramatically increased temperatures. And then you can see the depth of the increased temperatures as well. What's the impact of this? Well, this is gonna change where the fish move. The fish, uh, most fish respond to the thermocline where you see a dramatic draw, a change in temperature in depth in the ocean. So that's gonna change where the fish are, which would be important if you're a tuna fisherman, let's say. Uh, you're gonna see changes in tropical cyclone activity, the, the 
ocean temperatures respond to climate, the tropical cyclones respond to ocean temperatures. And so the, 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 the darker red, the thicker, the warmer temperatures, the more severe the tropical cyclones are gonna be. And then here's just a, a nice full page uh, handout or, or a printout that you can use of all of those evidence cards. So this is what the students have. They have all of the evidence cards. They can think about the impacts. This is the EPA diagram that I've talked about, just listing some of the impacts. And then what do we do with this information? I talked about mitigating, adapting, mitigating again, reducing greenhouse gas, uh, less fossil fuels. And so these are kind of some simple mitigation adaptation measures that the students can think of when you think about adaptation and mitigation. I mentioned this PBS uh, learning media approach. I'm not gonna run this, but it's a short video to think about adaptation and mitigation. You can have them watch this before we go into the case studies. And so here are the case studies. I talk about Kiribati. What do you do if you're two meters, three meters? Is the highest point three meters? What do you do if that's the case and it's already gone up a foot and the projection is another one, two, three, four feet? Well, you can read the note here. Uh, Kiribati has actually bought land in Fiji uh, in case they have to move. So you can think about the impact of that. You can think about what sea level rise is going to do to coastal erosion and, and fishing and, and food habitat and so forth. And you can use this, students can use this uh, along with that adaptation and impacts approach to think about what, the, what, what might happen. The second one is uh, agriculture in China. And what happens if there's more droughts, uh, more arid uh, conditions in central China? What does that do to the crops? You can read the note there on the left. Some crops won't thrive. So what do you do? You change your crops. You can think about handling that from an extreme event standpoint. And even about the cost connected to irrigation, changing crops and so forth. The third case study is Cape Town, South Africa. There's a bunch of people standing up for water. You can read the description there on the left. Uh, Cape Town a couple of years ago came really close to running out of water because of a severe drought. Uh, luckily, they never actually got there, but you could, they had police uh, monitoring people access to well water, which as you can see in that picture. And you can think about what will happen to cities if we start to run out of water. I talked about Las Vegas at the beginning of my lecture a, a little while ago. The final case study is Africa. I taught uh, Alaska. I talked about how the Arctic is warming at double or triple the rate of the rest of the globe and really the places that are being hit the hardest or, or certainly some of the places in the world that are being hit the hardest are the far northern Arctic, uh, you think about the native Alaskan communities uh, up in the northern Arctic are just being hit. Uh, some villages have already had to move. There's already climate refugees. They've already moved inland because of the damage of increased sea level, increased storminess. Uh, this is a picture of somebody going out, uh, well, he should be going out ice fishing uh, but the river's not frozen over. And so think of the impact on your livelihood, uh, on your food supply, on your subsistence existence. In some cases, you're supposed to go out into the ice to hunt the whales. The ice isn't there. The whales aren't there because the thermocline and the structure of the sea is, is changed. What's that gonna do to your community? And so you can use this as a case study for the students uh, as well. And then the final example, is the Belizean Barrier Reef. So this is off of the east coast of Belize and uh, southern Mexico, Yucatan, second biggest barrier reef in the world, and it's in deep trouble. You've got rising sea levels, which reduces the sunlight, which is gonna damage the reef. You've got increased ocean acidification, increased ocean temperatures, which is gonna damage the reef. Um, you've got uh, increased turbidity connected to human activity, which is gonna increase problem of coral bleaching. All of this is going on. Uh, and the students can think about what the impact uh, of that is going to be. And then the final example, uh, and there are fact sheets like this for every state, so you can have the students break out by state, uh, is to think about what are the impacts gonna be uh, for a particular location, uh, and you can think about adapt adaptation strategies uh, to address this problem. You can zoom this in on any state. You can print out these uh, EPA fact sheets and give them to the students. We're just, of course, using Oklahoma, and you can click on the link if you want some other ones.
you could combine these exercises and uh, use a giant map if you want to look at, let's say, changes in the U across the U.S. or uh, Europe or whatever. Uh, but these are the lesson plans that uh, Angela put together. And then, of course, you can tie it back to the Q, um, the, 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 the TQD aspect, the D aspect of the discoveries, and then get the students to, to integrate all of this understanding of climate, climate variability, climate change, adaptation, mitigation, to address the, the state standards. Okay, so that's basically it for the lecture. I wanna thank everybody for uh, listening, participating. Just as a reminder, you can contact me if you have any questions. Scott Green, my email is jgreen with an E on the end, J-G-R-E-E-N-E -E -E at ou.edu. You can contact Becca Castleberry, she's the program director of OKH, and her email is just OKH, O-K-A-G-E at ou.edu. Look on the website, uh, grab the information that you want. We also have these professional development uh, activities monthly, so the second Tuesday of every month, and you should get an email from Becca uh, or from the state social studies ed coordinator regarding these. And we'll have, we'll just highlight one new topic and one new area of geographic information to, tied to the lesson plans, uh, tied to the lesson plans that the teacher consultants use, and then tied to the Oklahoma standards. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for watching, and I appreciate you listening.